Remember when MMOs were worlds first and games second? When players knew each other by name or reputation? When the letters MMORPG actually meant something? MMOs have been my favorite genre since I was introduced to EverQuest in 1999. Whether it was feeling entirely lost after RuneScape's December 2003 graphics update, finding my first Dragon Ball on Conquer Online, or finally reaching Lion's Arch in Guild Wars 1 to realize it was only the beginning of the game, I was convinced MMOs could produce a unique experience no other genre could. But as time progressed, MMOs lost their magic. In fact, the features that originally made them great are scarcely found in modern titles. What happened? To get a better appreciation for the current state of the genre, we need to know its origin story. With every story, there are characters. So let's meet Richard Bartle, Raph Koster, and this guy. Their contributions to the MMO genre have been monumental, and without knowing them, it's difficult to understand why modern MMOs suck. So let's do some time travel. MMOs were the natural outgrowth of MUDs, multi-user dungeons the earliest of which became playable in the late 70s. Those who originally designed MUDs were academics and researchers who happened to also be game developers. For example, Richard Bartle, on his route towards obtaining a PhD in AI, designed the very first MUD, which, by the way, is still playable. In terms of what gameplay experiences MUDs provided, Ralph Costa wrote that they emphasized at least one of four design spaces, chat, building, PvP, and level treadmills. Coincidentally, these overlap with the four play styles identified by Bartle, whose observation was later adapted into the Bartle test that scores how players interact within a virtual world. While various MUDs emphasized one or more of these categories, each is fundamental and intrinsic to the core experience. To represent these elemental features of MUDs, we will use this box to help show the evolution of the genre. Now, it should be noted that these early MUDs were not graphical, and the limitation of not visually representing physical space was problematic. But as personal computers became increasingly powerful, and as the ubiquity of the internet developed, MUDs became not only more popular, yet could also harness the power of 2D and 3D rendering. From each section of the square blossomed a new type of 3D experience. Ashron's Call and EverQuest emphasized socializing and exploring, UO with killing and building, and Star Wars Galaxies into every space. Unsurprising as Raph was one of its core developers. While we think of these titles as MMOs, their creators did not. For example, Meridian 59, EverQuest, Ultima Online, Dark Age of Camelot, and RuneScape were all conceptualized by their producers as MUDs. To illustrate, Brad McQuaid, the genius behind EverQuest, called the MMO a MUD in 2000 during an interview with RPG Vault. Note that the interplay between the terms MUD and MMO in this context was not emphasizing a departure, it was a clarification. MMO RPGs were massive multiplayer online role-playing games in which the very first word particularly mattered. In fact, you could make the argument that early MMOs were a subgenre of the graphical MUD umbrella. Most people who play these games, myself included, recall them being social, group-oriented, and challenging. They were worlds first and games second. Systems were a means to an end and supported emergent gameplay experiences. These lessons were encapsulated in Bartle's 700-page magnum opus entitled Designing Virtual Worlds, published during this time in 2003. But later developers neglected to heed its warnings and the sirens would soon begin to sound. As time progressed, the experiential difference between playing a MMO and a MUD became too great for the games to share the same title. Due to the scale and graphical differences, it became useful to label text-only or text-primary online MMOs as MUDs and their graphical counterparts as MMOs. But Raph observed that these early MMOs were staying too close to the MUD framework, not in design philosophy, but in commercialization. These experiences needed to be marketed to new audiences to keep the genre alive. Q World of Warcraft in 2004. And no, WoW is not the villain of the story. For many, it's synonymous with the MMO genre. You may know someone who knows about WoW specifically, yet not about MMOs generally. Vanilla WoW innovated in the same ways that EverQuest and Ultima Online did to prior MUDs. The game was more accessible, more graphically pleasing, and familiar. Many of its users grew up playing Warcraft, so the transition to playing a human warrior from commanding their empire was comfortable. Not only did Blizzard improve on the basic formula that made earlier MMOs more successful than MUDs, they also brought the marketing expertise that other companies either lacked or overlooked, so much so that Vanilla WoW and its first two expansions are still remembered today as the pinnacle of MMO design. 
In this way, Blizzard was best able to balance the needs of players whose gameplay preferences spread across the Mud Spaces diamond. It seemed like MMOs could only keep improving. And here's when the villain arrives. Just as early MMOs suffered from lackluster marketing knowledge, modern MMOs in the post-WoW era have incestuously suffocated in WoW's shadow of success. If you have played MMOs at great length, you would be familiar with the term WoWification that describes this trend. In essence, Blizzard inadvertently popularized the meta of MMO development. From a business perspective, games need to make money. MMOs are expensive and risky, not to mention many fail even before they're released. Thus, if one is to be undertaken, it needs to have a reasonable chance to be profitable. Since WoW was the undisputed king of MMOs in the West, it became the formula, the new canon. The problem here is that business executives missed the forest for the trees. It wasn't that WoW directly modified the MMO landscape itself. But this guy saw the potential to make a profit using WoW as the MMO formula. So, in partnership with publishers and stockholders, worlds were slowly replaced with systems. Because, instead of being tied to the fundamental essence that made WoW great, i.e. its connection still to MUDs, these MMOs only ostensibly paid homage to their digital ancestors while offering a foundationally different experience. Hence, the Great Replacement began. For example, quests in Vanilla WoW were designed to collectively draw players to points of interest that otherwise they may have missed, but WoW clone designers replaced the journey of completing quests to merely finishing mindless tasks in a predictable sequence that happened to be called a quest. Thus, the Explore box was replaced with quests in name only. In lieu of building trusted friendships through socialization, group finders found prominence. Instead of achieving greatness through effort and skill, you started receiving login rewards to entice you to play, as if to suggest that the game wasn't even rewarding to play on its own. These replacements are game design equivocation, similar to brood parasite bird species that lay counterfeit eggs in another mother's nest, only to rob the original chicks not only of nourishment, but also life. Thus, this guy surreptitiously replaced the original diamond with a look-alike decoy. But this wasn't all. He also created a layered shield around it, primarily open via microtransactions. Instead of having unrestricted access to the entire and original diamond through the simple formula of a box prize and subscription, you need to pay separate tolls to participate in each square. But of course, these squares no longer have the original content. They only have the same outside appearance, yet provide a superficial alternative. Obviously, the problem with this model is that it replaces the hero's journey with a mirage of grandeur only perpetuated by spending ever-increasing amounts of money. In this way, this period ushered in the great replacement of Bartle and Roth's mud gameplay model, with this guy's monetization strategy of fiscal shielding and parasite swapping. Moreover, to improve the profitability of the diamond shield, marketers started analyzing player behavior in order to more aggressively monetize it. This is why many modern MMOs artificially create problems to sell you solutions. Need more inventory space? Use the item shop. Ryan is too slow? Use the item shop. Feel underpowered in PvP? Use the item shop. Want to look cooler than your friend? Use the item shop. But hey, the game's technically free, right? Layered on top of these departures from Mud Cannon was the increased separation of developers from design as a result of increased publisher and investor oversight. Instead of the player's experience being the KPI indicating success, profitability became paramount. This is why we're no longer virtual adventurers. We've become digital consumers. This nefarious inversion was foreseen by some. Prophetically written nearly 15 years ago, during the apex of WoW's success, Bartle scribed, Some old-timers know the history of MMOs and whence they came, but most of today's developers haven't a clue. If you forget your story, you forget who you are. In retrospect, it's thus no surprise that while early MMOs failed to market successfully, modern MMOs have monetized the RPG out of the MMO. But it doesn't have to end that way. On the bright side, the windfall of WoW's success can also be understood ecologically. Eruptive growth is when a species experiences a massive boom in population, yet after it consumes the available resources, its population quickly dwindles. During this waning period is when some of the original population experience phylogenic regression, which is essentially reverting to an earlier, more successful build. See where I'm going with this? This is why many companies have officially supported old school or classic versions of their MMOs. EverQuest, Lotro, WoW, and RuneScape are the most notable examples. Moreover, in recent years, efforts have been made to develop MMOs that remind gamers of titles like EverQuest or Ultima Online. Embers Adrift features group-based gameplay. Project Gorgon focuses on player freedom, discovery, and cooperation. 
Albion Online emphasizes open-world PvP. Pantheon and Monsters and Memories are both spiritual successors of EverQuest. Crowfall, for all its struggles, has attempted to rekindle the Throne War fantasy of Shadowbane. In fact, Raf Koster is leading the development of playable worlds, and Ashes of Creation may be the phoenix down our genre has needed for many years. Yet, besides commercial MMOs, private servers are alive and active that provide access to a world of MMOs before WoW's Shadow of Success darkened the genre. Warhammer Online, Ashran's Call, City of Heroes, Conquer Online, Neverwinter Nights, and Project 1999, just to name a few. So, there's hope. Some companies are reading the writing on the wall that gamers are looking for experiences that represent what each letter of MMORPG demands without the fantasy-breaking paywall. The point is that we want the original mud-based Diamondback with all the refinements in technology and accessibility we have come to expect. Yet, we should also acknowledge that just as MMOs developed out of muds, other genres have evolved out of MMOs. Survival, Battle Royale, online ARPGs, and arguably whatever the metaverse will be. To this end, while it's possible that the so-called golden era of MMORPGs has already passed, we stand at the precipice of possibly something even better. Thanks for watching, and subscribe for more MMO content.